Thank you very much, Kayla. So we're going to be having this panel discussion for about half an hour. Um, and of course, there are hugely many questions that we could try to cover, hugely many aspects of this issue that we could try to cover in that time. And we can't possibly cover everything. So we're going to have a bit of a, a peppering of various various points that uh, it'll be good to, to be thinking about. Um, and we have three speakers in this panel. So two of those are people whom you saw already this morning. So Jess from this morning is joining us again. And Jamie uh, is also joining us again. And we have a third and new panelist who's Francis Foley. And Francis is the deputy director of Compass, which is an organization that campaigns for a better democratic society, among other things. So uh, Jamie, Jess and Francis, welcome to you all uh, to this panel. And thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, so the plan is that um, Francis, Jess and Jamie, in that order, will offer some opening reflections on all of the various issues um, that we're exploring uh, this weekend, just for a few minutes each. And then uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion among ourselves. I'll, I'll put various questions to Francis, Jess and Jamie, which I hope will be helpful for um, uh, encouraging your thinking on these issues. And then later in the afternoon, you'll have lots of opportunity to put your questions to our speakers as well. So with that, I shall hand over first to Francis, who's going to offer some opening remarks. Francis, over to you. Thanks, Alan. It's really nice to be here today. Um, if I have a problem with internet at all, I'm sure people are going to uh, make it known to me. But yeah, um, do shout because it's been a little bit dodgy. Um, so yeah, so what I'm here to talk about today um, is, I, I know you've all been talking about representative democracy uh, and the questions and problems and challenges that arise from it. Um, and what I'm really here to, to talk about is this question of where power lies um, in our system. And um, to my mind, uh, power in the UK political system is too far away from people. So within a representative model, we send people to Westminster um, as our MPs. But power is extremely concentrated at the centre in the UK uh, model. So in Westminster and Whitehall, the vast majority of political decisions are made. We're one of the most centralised countries in Europe, if not the world. Um, other countries have more of a federal model where they have different layers of government where different decisions are made. And despite the Welsh and Scottish parliaments we have, local government in the UK is extremely limited in what it's able to do. This means that things can't be dealt with locally and people still feel a lack of representation. So um, even in the recent pandemic, we can see that a lot of uh, the top scientists were saying, if we dealt with this at a local level by using local data, we would do much better. But local government wasn't equipped to do that and wasn't able to respond as agilely. So we had to do everything from the top down. And um, this also means that it's hard for people to connect with people who represent them. It just means a lot of work for MPs, basically. And I think this is um, a difficulty because we pile a lot on our um, MPs and we put a lot of pressure and expectations on them. Um, and that's good because we want a functioning uh, relationship with our MPs. But we also want people at different layers of government who can respond with the kind of um, with the speed and the agility that we need to make the decision properly. So my argument would be the layers of government are really important in the UK. Power should go to the lowest appropriate level where it's possible to make that decision. And that allows people a much better chance to be represented and to participate, which is really important for a strong and healthy democracy. Thank you very much, Francis. And Jess next. Great. So I spoke this morning about direct democracy, um, which can be a really useful tool to allow citizens to directly shape decisions that affect them. But different mechanisms have different strengths and weaknesses, and so they're better used on some issues rather than others. So referendums can be a really good way to enhance democracy by allowing citizens to vote on some of the big decisions facing the country. And they can also ensure that those big decisions have the agreement of the population and therefore have legitimacy. So something like Scottish independence, it's difficult to imagine happening without um, some kind of vote. But referendums are also a blunt mechanism for assessing public opinion. They usually have a kind of yes or no or a two option answer. And a lot of people might feel that they're actually somewhere in the middle. Referendums can sometimes push people to the extremes. 
it's also quite difficult to manage trade-offs within referendums. So if you ask people if they, whether they would like more funding for the NHS, they'd probably say yes. But if you'd ask people if they wanted uh, the same people, if they wanted tax increases, they would say no. Referendums aren't very good at working out what level of tax increases people might be willing to tolerate to fund the NHS. They can only give a yes or no answer. There's also a risk that referendums can be quite bad at protecting minority rights because they work on a basis of the majority, 50% plus one wins the vote. This can be a particular problem in uh, when we use citizens initiated referendums and we've seen some places where they're used like in the US, we've seen votes opposing measures like gay rights or anti-discrimination initiatives. So there's a risk there of minority rights. And Coming to petitions, petitions are a very low cost and easily accessible way for people to express a view on an issue. We saw right at the beginning when in Paula's first slides that a lot of people have signed one. Um, they can put issues that people really care about on politicians' agendas, so they can put pressure on them to support a particular cause. And there is evidence in some cases that they have led to changes in the law. But there's also a risk because even if even petitions have millions of signatures, they only represent a fraction of people in the UK. Petitions can't tell us the balance of public opinion on an issue, and sometimes it might create problems if you know a small group of people who feel very strongly about something, their views override that of everyone more broadly. It's also quite difficult um, for petitions to take into account the trade-offs between different groups and factors. So during the coronavirus lockdown, there were lots of petitions calling for different things to be opened, like schools and gyms and pubs and nightclubs. And all these petitions had thousands of signatures. But the government couldn't open all of these things and it needed to make a decision not just based on public opinion, but based on other evidence like the risk of COVID spreading in different sec sectors um, and also the, the value of, of that sector to the economy. And I think sometimes when politicians don't listen to petitions for good reasons, it might look like it's the people who aren't be being listened to. So I think referendums and petitions and other forms of direct democracy have a lot of potential, but I think we need to think carefully about when they are best used and when they're most appropriate. Excellent. Thank you, Jess. And over to Jamie. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Hello again. So in this short reflection, I will pick up on where I left off this in this morning's talk, uh, focusing specifically on citizens' assemblies and some of the challenges associated with them. Um, so the first challenge uh, I want to highlight is to avoid seeing them as solutions to all problems. Uh, they can work well on some issues, but not others. So let me give you an example. Uh, a couple of years ago, whenever Parliament was in a state of gridlock over Brexit, some suggested that a citizens' assembly could provide a way out of this political deadlock. and these suggestions tended to come overwhelmingly from people who thought that leaving the EU would be a mistake. And so immediately, or almost immediately, the idea of holding a citizens assembly became associated as a, a way of overturning the original referendum result and stopping Brexit from happening. So if a citizens assembly is associated with a particular outcome, favoring one side over another, so in other words, if they themselves become politicized, then they may do more harm than good. A further challenge is to meaningfully connect citizens' assemblies to existing institutions and processes. Uh, there can be a real tension here. If citizens' assemblies are too detached from elected politicians, then there is a risk that their recommendations will be ignored and never implemented. If, on the other hand, elected politicians are too close to the process, then there's a risk that they will try to steer the agenda of a citizens' assembly in a particular direction and or to try and simply get the citizens' assembly to rubber stamp something that politicians would be planning to do anyway. In either of those cases, a citizens' assembly would not be treated very seriously as an addition to the, the political system. And a final challenge is to meaningfully connect citizens' assemblies to the wider public. These processes are necessarily inclusive in that they uh, bring together a diverse group from the wider public, but they're also necessarily exclusive because you have to be invited to take part. Uh, but that said, there are ways of trying to promote participation from the wider public. Um, for example, the wider public could be 
invited to submit their own views on the issue in question. In the Irish Citizens Assembly on abortion, for instance, over 12,000 submissions from the wider public were, were submitted, which were then taken into account by the members of the Citizens Assembly themselves. And if it is considered important to involve the wider public in making a decision, then the issue could always be put to a referendum, with the Citizens Assembly at least giving voters a recommendation to help inform their decision. So in short, while I think Citizens Assemblies have great potential to add value to democracy, I would suggest that they can't be expected to, to solve every issue. And we have to think carefully about how they relate to elected politicians on the one hand and the wider public on the other. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Jamie. So we've already got uh, lots of really big and important ideas here. So from uh, Francis, we've got ideas about maybe we rely too much on our central uh, representative institutions and we should try to move power out a bit more. Uh, and then Jess and Jamie have both offered thoughts on ways in which uh, referendums and petitions and citizens assemblies might be good for some things, not so good for other things, and we have to be quite careful uh, in choosing uh, how we use these things. Let's um, go first a bit deeper into our representative system of democracy and um, just how that system works and how we can ensure that it works as well as possible, um, just given how important that is in the overall uh, system. Um, Francis, I know that you have lots of experience of engaging with uh, our representative democracy and thinking about our representative democracy and, and thinking about the role of campaign groups in that and so on. Um, do you want to say a bit more about your perspective on, uh, on, 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 on what people's role in the representative democracy is? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, a good way about think of thinking about this is that any political system needs to balance two different things. So firstly, it has to be accepted by people, so it has to be sort of fair and legitimate. And second, it needs to be able to kind of act and provide effective government. So it needs to solve problems, it needs to make people's lives better, it needs to be able to make decisions. And so one part of that has to be representative democracy because it takes a lot of time and effort if everybody was involved in every single system in a mass culture, in a, in a, in a large population, you can't involve everybody in every single decision. And we have a relationship with our MPs. But obviously that is in some respect counter to one of the ways in which democracy works, which is this principle of equality. So this idea of equal say, equal share, equal voice. Um, and I think, therefore, sometimes we do our democracy a disservice when we focus just too much on elections, because this means this is one narrow part of democracy. And actually, there's many ways in which people can be involved, whether that's to do with joining trade unions or joining campaign groups or protesting. These are all really valid ways that people participate in democracy. And a final point I would make about that is just that if we think about democracy not just as, a, as something that people have a right to, so they have a right to be represented, a right to be heard, but also about maybe the most effective way to make collective decisions in the common good is about hearing people. So hearing their views, their experience, their wisdom, this is why civil assemblies are such a good idea. Everybody has something to contribute. So it's not just about the idea that people have a, a right to be heard. It's also that there's an expectation in a democracy that things work better when people um, contribute what they know to make society work better for everyone. And I think sometimes representative democracy can cut corners there by electing a few people to make the decisions, whereas actually, more participatory forms of uh, democracy and engagement and conceiving of democracy in a wider sense, i.e. a lot of the things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives can contribute to democracy, would make for a stronger system, ultimately. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to think a bit further about how we can ensure that our representative democracy works as well as possible. And I'm wondering if each of you can identify one key problem and one key potential solution uh, to that problem in the representative democracy. Uh, now, time is limited. Francis, you've kind of already uh, given, given that in, in your first remarks when you uh, suggested that a problem is uh, that we rely too much on our national representative institutions and some decentralization uh, might be a good thing. Um, Jess, what would be your answer to that question? Of what, what's one key problem in our representative democracy at the moment and a potential solution to it? Going back to a key problem, um, I 
to go back to what Paula's uh, presentation was talking about in the beginning and a lot of people don't feel very engaged in politics and I think part of the reason for that is a lot of people don't feel like they have enough information to be able to access some of those debates and I think we rely a lot on politicians um, particularly around elections kind of coming towards us giving us information and making a case but sometimes it can be difficult for people to understand exactly the argument they're making to figure out whether or not they agree with it um, or sometimes to, to kind of tell whether they're telling the truth or whether they're telling the whole story there so I think one thing that could be used to kind of reinvigorate our, our democratic um, culture um, could be making sure that people have access to impartial, independent information. There's lots of different ways that this um, could happen. There's lots of organisations out there that are already doing work like this. So, for example, Full Fact, um, which fact checks some things that politicians say. Um, there's also a possibility that you could have something that was funded um, completely separate from government, but potentially funded by, by government or collectively by, by, by the state to, to ensure that people can access that information at elections specifically, but perhaps more widely as well. Thank you, Jess. And Jamie, how about you? Yeah, well, for me, I think one key potential problem of representative democracy is is a perception um, that the parliament as the, the key institution really of making representative democracy work, a perception that it's disconnected or that it's not representative enough, that the politicians who, who represent us are somehow out of touch with, with the wider public. Um, so that can, can be a, a real problem um, in, in leaving people feel that they, they don't have as much of a, a stake or that they're not represented by, by the existing institutions that we have. So I think one key solution, um, although one of, of many that, that could exist, is for, for more people to, to feel uh, equipped and confident themselves to put themselves forward to, to stand for Parliament. Um, I mean, one view is that you have to be somehow qualified or you have to be you know, really clued into politics to be a politician. So that that may help. But if the idea of representative democracy is to be able to represent people from different backgrounds, different experiences, um, then it, surely that that means that, that more people should maybe consider um, putting themselves forward and seeing themselves as, as equipped to, to be members of parliament themselves. So there's room for all of us as citizens uh, to maybe rethink about what it, it means to, to be a, a politician, that they're really citizens too, but they've just done something that put themselves forward for election for in the first place and then more more broadly I suppose there's a role for political parties to give more incentives to widen the the base of people who who they're trying to recruit to stand for them as well as other things like uh, social media platforms being um, maybe uh, maybe stepping up their game in in dealing with abuse that, that people may face if they do put themselves uh, forward into the public eye so not one solution sorry for maybe saying too much but ideas to think about. Very good, yeah. So that, that issue of that kind of feeling of disconnect between us and, and the politicians and the fact that actually the politicians are <laughs> kind of like us in many ways. Uh, yeah, really important. Good. Let's think then about some of the other um, uh, elements of the democratic process. Um, so petitions, let's start with petitions, because they're currently um, used in the UK for only very limited pur purposes. But I've been noticing when I've been going into the groups of with assembly members this weekend and in past weekends that people have often asked about um, whether people have or should have the power to do uh, various different things without having to rely on, on the elected politicians to get in there first. So um, Jess, can I ask you as our expert on uh, direct democracy here, what would be the advantages and disadvantages of, of various different ways in which we might use petitions. So let's just start. One idea is that we should be able to petition in order to have a general election. What would be the advantages and disadvantages of that? So the thing to remember is that petitions, even those with lots of signatures, I think the record is around six million signatures, only represent a fraction of people and a fraction of people's opinions. The challenge of using a petition to allow for a general election is that there's always going to be 
perhaps even a majority of people who didn't vote for the current government or who didn't vote for their MP. And so if you allowed people to trigger general elections by petitions with a low threshold, so say something like 10%, which is common in other places, then we just might end up in an absolute constant cycle of elections because whoever wasn't supporting the party currently in power would then be able to trigger another one. I mean, the solution to that potentially would be to have a very high threshold. You could even say something like 50% if the majority of people want to want to election then there should be one but that would mean about 25 million people signing a petition and as I mentioned the record there is six million so it's quite difficult to see how you could design a system that would that would make sense and avoid this kind of constant cycle of elections. Okay so petitions to call a general election probably not a good idea and I guess the same applies to any idea that a petition might kind of directly change the law because it's always going to be just a minority of people who are signing a petition. So what about this idea which you mentioned of a, a petition to call a referendum on an issue? Uh, is that actually a good idea? So, um, to call referendums, are, are they, take, they happen in other places in, in the world. And what they allow is they allow a mechanism um, in which people can object to a particular decision that government's made. So they could object to a particular law or to try and get the government to do something that they're not doing on their own initiative. So there's benefits in, in that way. Um, I think one thing I, I would say is actually when you look at places that use citizens um, initiated referendums, it's actually quite rare that they're successful, that they actually lead to a vote to change. Sometimes that's because the majority of people don't support the change that's been proposed in the petition. Sometimes it's just because the turnout is very low. They're not on issues that people really, really care about. Um, I also mentioned earlier, there is this slight risk that using a, a, um, a device that relies on majority control can lead to problems for protecting the rights of minorities is something else that we might want to bear in mind here. So they have potential, um, but perhaps we want to think about the best circumstances in which they should be used. Yeah, and that perhaps leads on to a next question about those particular circumstances in which we might uh, use uh, these different mechanisms. Jamie, maybe, maybe I can turn to you on, on exactly that issue, actually. Uh, so Jess has just touched on the idea that there might be some circumstances in which it's fine to hold referendums and some not. Would you have any further th thoughts on that question? Yeah, so I think uh, one good use of, of, say, citizens assemblies would be whenever there is an issue where uh, there is enough consensus that a problem exists or that the, the status quo is, is somehow inadequate, that something needs to, to change, but where it's maybe not very clear about what should be done um, and, and certainly where it's it's not a binary question of, of what should be done is it either this or that if there is a problem that's widely acknowledged to, to exist and it's not clear that it's only between two options that we could have a way forward because then a citizens assembly can be a way of, of, of fairly uh, hearing the, the different options that do exist where the, the, the citizen members consider those different options they weigh them up uh, hear evidence, listen to, to arguments for and against, or uh, as many of the different uh, perspectives that there are, um, before making a recommendation. So in contrast then to, to cases where uh, maybe there isn't very much of a consensus that there a, pro a problem exists in the first place, or where it is a polarizing issue to, to begin with, with two very clear uh, camps already uh, in, in motion. So if we just think of some examples of where that would be the case then, um... I mean, I guess so climate change is probably the biggest issue on which there's been a citizens assembly in the UK. Can you just walk us through why that might have been a good issue to hold a, a citizens assembly on? Yeah, so that was an issue then where there was pretty much cross party consensus then that there is this target of reducing um, our, our uh, carbon emissions to, to net zero by 2050. So that's that's pretty much uh, agreed across the board, across the political spectrum. But then there's there are a lot of questions about how do we actually get there? What are the practicalities involved? What are all the, the trade-offs when we, we look at different sources of carbon emissions? So there's a lot of complexity. So uh, those six parliamentary committees from MPs from different parties, they, they called a citizens assembly on that specific topic to then look at this in pretty forensic detail, hearing evidence from, from different sectors and different parts of the whole climate change picture, uh, the different um, ways in which our emissions um, are 
are, um, are being counted and could be reduced, but, and then making recommendations. So at the end of that process, over many uh, weeks and, and months, uh, the citizens produced 50 recommendations, which then went back to government. So it's taken a, an issue where there's a broad agreement about a problem and then coming up with specific recommendations based on the evidence and arguments. Yeah, OK, so there's broad agreement that there is this problem. There isn't kind of great clarity on what the solutions might be or what the you know, you know there isn't kind of two sides as to it's this solution or that one. There's there's various possible solutions and no one's quite worked out what they think. So in that in that circumstance, the citizens assembly is a really good way potentially of, of helping to push the debate forward. Great. Um, Francis, you also mentioned in your comments um, that uh, it's good to get people involved in citizens' assemblies and things like that. Would you have any any further very quick comments on when we use citizens' assemblies and when we shouldn't use them? Yeah, I think you've already touched on some of the main ones, which is that it has to be something which is a, a collective responsibility and something that everybody kind of feels some level of engagement in. I think there's a number of other examples of that where um, I think this is a, there's a political decision made by the people who initiate the, the citizen assembly about whether and how um, to engage with the topic. So if you look at the case of somewhere like Ireland, looking at around um, equal marriage or abortion legislation, they had to sort of time that right. And I think that's a big question for politicians who initiate the assembly. Is this a good time? Is there enough kind of interest and engagement with this topic? And I think then this is a really important point about representative democracy. The representatives themselves need to be willing to hear what comes out of the citizen assemblies and have thought through how they're going to act on it. So I think this is a, an interesting example of where you've got a representative system and a participatory deliberative system in the form of citizen assembly, and they kind of meet. And this question of how they interact, you know, who has more legitimacy, what is done with the recommendations is still an area where there's a lot of thought and, uh, and a lot of kind of different ways of approaching this. Yeah, it's a really important point, isn't it? You can't actually have a citizens assembly that's it's a kind of an alternative to the representative process. Uh, you need to have have these uh, processes kind of working together and uh, forming an effective whole. OK, um, one final question to each of you before we've only got three minutes left, I'm afraid. So we're going to have to be really quick on this one. Quite a big and controversial question. So do citizens have duties? in a democracy and if so what are they so you know we're, we're often talking here about the things that we want the system to give us but also if the system is going to work then maybe we need to give something to the system too francis what would you say on that well i'm going to go back to this question of equality so i think at the core of democracy is this question of equality um, and i think the reason i mentioned participation in many different ways earlier is because often people when people say democracy they think voting now, I think there are many different ways for citizens to be involved in things. And I think, yes, in some respects, they do have duties. But, you know, to make a more political point, I think this is a question of like duties go together with rights and more equal systems encourage, you know, equality of contribution. The equality of contribution isn't the same across the population. So people don't have the same amount of time, confidence, skills, experience, you know, to do this. And I think those two things have to go hand in hand. So if we're serious about asking people to be involved and to participate, we have to give them serious ends. We have to facilitate it for people. And we have to make people feel like their participation matters, that it's meaningful, that something will come of it. Um, I think we're not quite there yet as a democracy, but citizen assemblies like this certainly help. Great. Thank you very much, Francis. Jess. I think citizens do have duties and I think the main duty is to hold those your representatives to account. Ultimately, the only way to, to change government or to change MPs is through a vote um, in, in the election. So I think it's really important that people are vigilant um, when making sure that um, their, elect, their elected representatives are performing the functions they expect and acting in the way that they expect um, to make sure that we, we stay in a democracy, essentially. <laughs> Fantastic. And Jamie? Yeah, so yes is my, is my short answer that I, I do think that the citizens do have, have duties um, among plenty, including to participate, hold uh, government to account and so on. One maybe that I would highlight is to listen. Um, I think that's a very important duty that, that we all have, both listening to, um, to information and evidence around us, um, that we, we try to seek out information that is good and reliable and, and trustworthy. And also that we listen to each other, uh, either you know our elected politicians or 
uh, other member of other non-elected uh, just members of the public um, because if we try to understand each other and other perspectives then I think that's another way in which democracy in general uh, can, can work better whenever we we as citizens understand where each other is coming from um, so I'll, I'll maybe leave it there Fantastic. Uh, we've run through a whole lot of different issues in uh, not very much time, though, but uh, I've certainly found that really interesting and helpful. So a huge thank you to Jamie, to Jess and to Francis for that. And now back to Kayla. Uh, 